from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 138, recorded live Wednesday, November 12, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Rick Brewster, author of Paint.NET. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm sitting here with Rick Brewster, author of Paint.net, the man, the legend, Paint.net, the only application to have crushed paintbrush. Uh, how's it going, Rick? Thanks for uh, chatting with me today. Yeah, thanks. It's going pretty good. So uh, how did this happen? How did you decide, uh, how did you guys decide to make a paint application? Oh, uh, well, it started my last semester of college at Washington State University. Uh, we were doing a senior design project, and one of the projects we got was from Microsoft to say, um, hey, why don't we do a paint program using GDI Plus? And so we had a mentor attached to it that helped us kind of go through the uh, process of setting up requirements and doing some design stuff and implementing it, making sure we had an actual uh, professional quality product with things like documentation. Uh, and then after that, I just kind of ran with it on my own and you know, did some updates, and there was another... Uh, set of kids back at Wazoo that I actually mentored through a version 2 release of it, including uh, Tom Jackson, who's also mm-hmm. here at Microsoft now. Um, and then we just kept running with it since then and doing improvements, especially based on what the community uh, kept asking for, you know, things like gradients or a special curve tool, etc., or all to- uh, features that were uh, community feed- or based on community feedback. Mm-hmm. How much of the process is plowing forward, just kind of pushing yourself forward, uh, even though the code doesn't feel right, versus looking back, refactoring, and saying, well, we really can't do, you know, feature B until we change the plugin model? Oh, that's a pretty big question. Um, <laughs> there are sometimes when there's a small feature that we can implement uh, that gets us a lot of sort of bang for the buck. For example, um, when I implemented the ability for the line tool to also draw curves, that was a pretty simple one. Uh, the gradient tool was also a simple one where we just added in using the existing architecture. But then there is also sort of this huge swath of features that we've been putting off for a really long time because the architecture of paint.net doesn't support it in a clean way or at least in a way where, you know, we'd have to implement a lot of stuff, you know, say in three different ways. And then if we wanted to redo that architecture in a better way, we'd have to re-implement those three things anyway. So... Mm-hmm. It's kind of a hard question to ask because there's a lot of features that actually have, you know, been putting off until I guess the, you know, now approaching mythical status version 4.0, which is going <laughs> to have, you know, every feature under the sun, of course. At least it's getting now, that reputation. And the whole thing's written in C sharp, right? Is there any C plus uh, plus? It's it is mostly C sharp. There is some C or C plus plus for. Um, there's a shell extension which handles things like uh, thumbnails. In Explorer for the native .pdm file type, there's um, there's a clipping library for polygons uh, called GPC, which is also written in. Actually, I guess it's mostly C. Uh, and then there's a library called Squish, which the DES, which uh, stands for Direct Draw Surface, uh, it uses that for decoding and encoding of the that DDS file format, which is something that they use for uh, games and uh, the XNA and the Xbox development stuff a lot. Hmm. Now, you know, now that 7's coming out, Windows 7's coming out, do you feel pressure to ribbonize it and make your app look pretty on 7? Because I've installed it on 7, and it, you know, it, it doesn't quite have that gloss. Um, I do get people asking me to put a ribbon in there uh-huh. pretty much all the time, but it's, <laughs> it's something you have to approach carefully in order to avoid what's called the cargo cult mentality, yeah. where people, where you think, oh, well, if I just add a ribbon, it'll be better. Um, are, you, are you familiar with the cargo cult? Metaphor? I am. Cargo cult programming. Right. So it's kind of, you know, related back to that, I think it was, you know, back in World War II where the natives on an island uh, had an abandoned airstrip and they decided to go out there and do kind of the 
uh, air traffic controller uh, hand signs, but then the planes with food and supplies did not come. So, mm-hmm. Well, I think that the ribbon is an interesting thing because uh, it's more of a, people think of it as being a, a feature that you just slap in, but really it's it's supposed to be a usability improvement. But if you just take the existing menus and toolbars and ribbonize them, you aren't necessarily improving usability. You're just adding a ribbon. So I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of thought about the user's workflow and how they how they live inside of Paint.net that you're going to need to think about. Otherwise, you're going to make a lot of people angry. Exactly. It, it can't just be, you know, a reshuffling of the UI. It has to actually be something that, because in Office, they put in a whole lot of thought in terms of, uh, they put a whole lot of thought into the workflow and the feature accessibility of, and how they organize stuff. It wasn't just, you know, removing the menus and dropping those into tabs on the on the ribbon. It was a, it was a much more intricate process. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you about that I, that I like about Paint.net as that I think stands out is its setup process. I think that uh, it's got an extraordinarily clean setup Um it doesn't appear that you're using the standard kind of MSI setup.exe that pops out of you know Visual Studio. And you know, I've always kind of found that the fact that two files pop out, both an MSI and an EXE, to be a little confusing. But Paint.net has always been, if you've got .NET on your machine, it's always pretty easy to uh, to install. How much work are you putting into the setup application? Uh, there's actually been quite a lot of work that's been put into there. Um, I can do a little bit of history on the installer if you want me to start with that. Please, yes. Okay. Uh, so originally, Paint.net was just distributed as an MSI, which was generated from Visual Studio Setup Wizard project. Uh, and, you know, you, you kind of create it in Visual Studio, you point it towards your main executable, and it figures out the dependencies and creates the MSI. Uh, you tell it the product name and the default installation directory, and then you're kind of done. And this works great for a lot of simple projects. Um, but as Paint.net grew... Um, there, you know, I needed to do more things with my installer. One of those was localization. And this is kind of difficult to do, at least in a way that's integrated with the whole rest of the localization. Uh, it, it's difficult to do with the built-in setup wizard. You can't just, uh, it doesn't have access to the same strings pool, um, et cetera. So I wrote my own setup wizard, which then P invokes into the Windows installer DLL, uh, MSI DLL, to run the MSI, which is still built with the setup wizard project inside of the studio. Mm-hmm. The other thing that had to be dealt with was uh, doing updates. And this was something that, uh, I don't know if you've worked with uh, building MSIs or building MSPs, but I read through a lot of the documentation and was unable to really figure out how to do them or how to do them correctly or to get some good examples online. So I decided that the update process for Paint on Net was just going to be uh, uninstall and then reinstall. And, um, mm-hmm. You know, the setup wizard is written in C sharp, and so it also gives me complete control over the user experience. For example, if I wanted to do like a WPF version of the install, I could do that, and it would be a pretty cool experience. But you know, it might not be necessary. Um, and the other thing that you kind of get with installers is that once it works, uh, you kind of don't want to touch it that much. So, you know, the fact, you know, like I said, I'm still using the built-in setup wizard project in Visual Studio, and that's kind of an artifact of the fact that. It, it works, so I'm not going to touch it. And it's not really something that affects the user experience. So it's not really, it's not a priority to change that. Mm-hmm. Now, I just took, um, as we were talking just now, I just took uh, paint.net uh, 336, 3.36, and I ran it. And it prompted me for an update. It said, hey, there's a new version. And no, I, I had something else like 335. It said 336. I hit install. Paint.net shut down and the installer went. It, re, it, it removed and, and then re, you know, it, it removed the old version and installed the new version. And now it wants to, uh, to restart my computer. Why is that? Um, I'm not sure. There's probably that is, something. That's part of the built in MSI experience because there's the cool paint.net setup thing on the outside there's that that white dialog that says paint.net is being installed that you then call out like you said into the msi at that point you don't mm-hmm. really have a lot of control like it wants to reboot but i have no way of knowing why right right uh it's probably the standard uh there was some system file that's locked or maybe it was installing a uh you know, probably just a system file that was locked that it was trying to update or something 
Mm-hmm. What did you write the little outside part in? Like right now it says optimizing performance for your system. This is when you call NGEN, right? That's the other thing that needed to be in the installer that was um, – you, you can do it as part of the MSI, but the user experience isn't quite the same. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not as integrated. You know, it just ends up being as you know another block on the progress bar where it's just important I can actually call it out and say, hey, I'm doing something that might take a minute, and here's uh-huh. what it is. And you know, the user gets a little more information about it. And, and what, did, what did you write the setup part, the, the wrapper part in? That's in C++? That, that setup wizard UI, it's in uh, C-sharp. It uses WinForms. Really? Yeah. And that actually kind of, you know, segues into the whole, you know, bootstrapper or chainer that I use that has to detect .NET before you can install paint.net. And that actually significantly impacts the setup experience for paint.net. All right. So this is where it's getting interesting. People may have lost, we may have lost a couple of people there because I'm, I'm jumping around here. But let's start at the beginning. You, you download you go to your site, you go to getpaint.net, and you hit download, and you bring yeah. down this um, zip file. It's, a, it's like a meg and a half. It takes no time at all. And inside mm-hmm. the zip file is an executable. And when you run that executable, you, know, you get the little prompt, and it's signed. There's a digital signature there, right? Yep. Because you've gone to the work of getting a cert from somebody, and you've signed that, that executable. So when you get the little complaint from Vista... It's actually a nice complaint because it says, oh, well, this, this is really from .pdn LLC. This is from the corporation, right? Yes. How did, so you, you have signed what at that point? So the way that works is I purchased a signing certificate from, I think it was Komodo, and then you install it into your local certificate store and you give it the right name, and then I have uh, some batch files as part of my build process where I actually set some environment variables that say, you know, sign PDN is one or zero, uh, because it does add some time to the, the build process. Mm-hmm. And then it either, you know, it signs the file with, you know, the correct name in there and the correct uh, certificate, which is stored in the local uh, certificate store. Mm-hmm. And it has to do that for, you know, the outer wrapper, the inner setup exe, and a couple other things. Yeah, so I'm looking at a little file on my hard drive right now. It says paint.net 336, and I right-click and say Properties. And there's a tab in the Properties that says Signature List, and it shows that yep. you stamped this in August. So I can go see Komodo, I can see .pdn LLC, uh, and mm-hmm. then it's been signed. If I double-click on it, I get the little prompt, which is a nice one because it says this is from you, so I know it's not uh, some random evil paint.net. And then there's this yeah, it's quick not the, little... F- it's not the big, scary, yellow version of the UAC dialog either. Exactly. It's, that's a good point. The scary yellow version of the dialog is the, this is unsigned. Correct. So, so that's, a, that's, how and, use, that's how people who have shareware can avoid that dialog, is to sign their, right. their, their outer right. wrapper. And the thing with the digital certificate or, you know, a signed file is, um, it, it's not that it, it, it's not, you know, like an antivirus thing. You know, you can't promise that something that's signed isn't, you know, going to do something bad. But you can mm-hmm. at least attribute that executable to somebody, you know, like if I sign it and the signature is holding up, then you know mm-hmm. that the file hasn't been tampered with. So you know that the only person that could have, you know, put that code in there was me. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, some website put, you know, some random junk in there that's doing something bad to your computer. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm not doing something bad. I wouldn't do something bad, but... You know that's really uh, that's really interesting because that 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 is one of the things that is similar uh, for SSL certificates. When when my right. wife visits, you know, our bank, she thinks that uh, HTTPS appearing in the address bar and having a little lock there indicates that she really is talking to that bank, and it really only indicates privacy. This right. it doesn't indicate it, it's trust. It's saying this hasn't been tampered with. Right. So when you know a, a, a virus, a really enterprising virus writer could certainly buy a cert and then say, "Yes, this is evil. I promise." But it's so evil that I've signed it with a cert, uh, which allows you to attribute, attribute it to them. Unless, of course, they stole your cert. I suppose, right? Right. So yeah, the other thing with the cert is that it gives something of a paper trail, so mm-hmm. that you know if the file hasn't been tampered with, then the only person that could have created it was the person who has that certificate or has the private side of that certificate, uh, which, mm-hmm. if it hasn't been stolen, is going to be me. So, mm-hmm. you know, if, uh, you know, they can, I suppose, go to the records of whoever issued the certificate and figure out who created that file. Exactly. 
So I double click on this and I get a, uh, a little pop up. I hit continue and then there's a, a flash. It just takes a second, just an instant. Mm-hmm. And then a, uh, what, what appears to be a PDN setup folder shows up in my app data temp. So if I go to my start yeah. run menu and I type in percent temp percent, uh, you made a PDN setup folder, unzipped a bunch of right. stuff in there, and then this really nice dialogue pops up, this really pretty dialogue. What is the outer shell written in, and, and what was that flash that I saw? All right. So so like you said, you know, it's dumping a bunch of files in that PDN setup folder. Um, so the outer shell of that is um, you know, your typical self-extracting executable type mm-hmm. thing. And I'm actually using something called Nullsoft in- Installer to create that. And you can... Uh, it's called NSI or NSIS, I think. Um, and you can use that to create an entire setup experience, but I'm actually only using it for my self-extraction process and uh, for checking a couple other things. Like I check uh-huh. to see if you're running on Windows 95 or something. Because yeah. You can't actually compile an EXE Visual Studio 2008 that does that. So. Yeah, that, um, that's actually called NSIS, right? It's, the, it's called the PIMP. Did you know that? It's called what? NSIS, Null Soft yeah. Super Pimp Installation System. <laughs> I thought the I stood for installation. So. Nope, nope. It, Null Soft are the guys that made Winamp, and this is the setup program yeah. that they made for Winamp. And NSIS, which is the, the, the installation system, is called the Null Soft, that's the N, Super Pimp Installation System. <laughs> they they changed it to Nullsoft Scriptable Installation System because people are offended by PIMP. But PIMP stands for Plugin Mini Packager. Right. So it's an acronym within an acronym. And it's a really, really tight, clean, very, very small installer. So you wrote a little tiny installer whose only mm-hmm. job it is is to look in the temp folder and then unzip itself and then run another installer. Pretty much. That's pretty clever. So um, then I'm looking at this dialog that says paint.net, and it says quick installation or custom installation. This is a right. WinForms application that I'm looking at? Right. It's a WinForms app. And there's actually a little history behind the quick and the custom buttons there. It used to be that paint.net went through, um, and you're using the default installer UI that was created in Visual Studio. It had, you know, hey, you know, here's your license agreement. Here, you know, where do you want to install it? Where the options do you want, et cetera? But most people installing a software, and I can get into a whole discussion about what, I, what I'm referring to when I say most people, um, mm-hmm. they don't care about most of that stuff. So the quick option gives them you know, basically a, a two or three click installation without access or without needing to look over all those you know, sort of nerdy options. And that actually really just cleans up the UI quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just that one option. It's next and finish at that point. It's pretty much at that point, all you have to do is accept the URL and bam, it just goes and installs it with all the default options. Because most people don't really care about where it gets installed or, you know, they just mm-hmm. want it to use sane and default options. So that's what I give them. Now, you're a, you're a, a you know, a micro ISV, you know, an independent software yeah. vendor, and you're a small one because it's you. Um, why have a EULA at all? Is that just, did your lawyer say to do that? Or what's what's the whole point of a EULA? It's a, it's a general legal thing. You know, if you release some software without, without a EULA, then there's sort of... Now, I'm not a lawyer, of course, but you mm-hmm. want to make sure that people realize, hey, you know, this software carries no warranties. Uh, you can't come after me for damages, but you know, in return, I'm also not charging you any money for it. So the the eight the eight of you guys that that wrote this originally, like all the different folks, yourself, Chris, Tom, Mike, all these guys uh, that were involved, just hired a lawyer and made a little LLC, and and who wrote this license? Uh, no, the license is actually. Um, it's the MIT license, oh, okay, and it's basically, cool. hey, here's some software, and you can do whatever you want with it, but mm-hmm. you can't remove our copyright. And uh, so the other guys actually were involved before the LLC was formed. The LLC is actually just mine. It's a sole proprietorship. Oh, I see. So I'm looking at the quick and custom options, and this application uh, is the setup frontend.exe. So I double-clicked right. on the outer wrapper. That was the little null soft stuff. It unzipped into a folder. I've got setup frontend.exe, and then I've got a setup front end, setup frontend exe config file. This is that little config file that tells uh, .NET what runtime version is preferred. This one says that it uses 2.0 as the minimum, but it also has a little additional bit of information that some people may not have seen before, which is 
SKU equals client. So you're saying that your little installer will work with the .NET 3.5 client SKU, or what we call the client profile. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, that's something that you have to add in. Otherwise, uh, if you have the client profile installed and you run a program that does not say SKU equals client, it will pop up a, a, a dialog that says, this program requires .NET 3.5 SP1. Go get mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so if you try to install paint on at 3.35, it will, or if, if you try to install on a system that has the client profile installed but not the full.net, it will give you that weird dialog. So in mm -hmm. 3.36, it was a dot zero one update. This was one of the things that went in there to ensure that paint on that would install just fine if you had uh, just the client profile installed. Okay, because the client profile is the subset of the .NET framework. And rather than assuming that applications will work with the with the subset, uh, they've added this SKU equals client attribute in order to basically declare that I know that I'll work with this this, this right. subset. Right, you have to so, opt into it. So, so you opt in, and you you work great, just fine with the smaller .NET .NET framework. Did you have to put a lot of thought into that? And, and um, I didn't have to put much thought in into it in terms of the development, but it actually did affect. Uh, my installation process a bit because I never had to include those .config files before. So now I had to go through and make sure it was included both in the MSI and in the uh, self-extractor and in the way I did my update because I actually copy a little exe called update monitor into the test mm -hmm. folder while I'm running the installer uh, mm -hmm. when I'm doing an update. And it also needed to make sure that I also had to make sure that the .config file was uh, copied along with that too. Now, in this temporary folder, there's also a setup shim.exe. What is that for? That is actually the thing that is executing setup frontend.exe. So when the uh, MSIS wrapper extracts itself, it then runs setup shim.exe. Setup shim is written, or it's a small exe, and it's written in C, and it checks for things like Windows installer, uh, the correct version of the .NET framework, and just to make sure that, you know, all the other files are there. Um, oh, and it also checks to make sure that the trusted installer service is enabled when you're on Windows Vista. Otherwise, things don't work. And I have a blog entry about that as well. So when I look at this uh, in Process Explorer, because sometimes Task Manager doesn't give you enough information, I'm right. looking at the process tree. Okay, so let's just take the, the, the listener back to where we were at the beginning. I downloaded a single executable. I double-clicked on it, and the experience was that I got a nice dialog that says Quick or Custom. But yep. if I look at this in Process Explorer, I see that paintnet 336exe called something called mirror shim, mirror shim called paint.net setup.exe, which called setup shim.exe, which called setup front end. So I've got five different processes that have all are all sitting there waiting uh, and uh, for setup front end to finish its work. That seems like a lot of stuff going on. Right. It actually does seem, it seems convoluted until I explain what each one of those does. Mm -hmm. So the setup shim is, you know, I was just talking about that. That's the main setup workflow. Uh, but then backing up to the paint on that setup.exe, that is actually another self extractor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then mirror shim is another little program written in C. And the reason for that being around is uh, because when you install, at the very end, you get that little, you know, it says optimizing performance, and then it says that little banner that says, hey, thanks for using paint.net, you know, please donate. And you can click on that and go to the website. But then there's also room for a second banner. And right now I'm using that banner to say, um, hey, here's the new features in paint.net version, you know, whatever the newest one is. Mm -hmm. But that banner is actually a PNG that's placed by MirrorShip. And the reason why I have a sort of a second or a separate wrapper to put that in is because I want to be able to build paint.net, sign paint.net, and then I want to be able to change that banner at a later time without having to spin up a new build, which has, you know, risk associated with it in terms of, you know, what if you know, somebody builds differently. Or, right, uh, you don't want to change the version number just because you want to I want the banner. version number and the timestamp and everything to stay the same where by allowing me to change that banner for, you know, maybe I, you know, have a different link that they can click on. Maybe uh, somebody wants a customized version for, hey, okay. I'm, and, and I've done this before. I had different versions of the installers for Beta News and MajorGeeks.com and some other mirrors where they all got their different banner, but I only had to do the main build once. But And then I just 
I redid the outer wrapper. Okay, so mirror shim is just, it just extracts that PNG. Because what I'm trying to understand is that I'm looking at five executables, and I'm thinking to myself as, as the, I guess as the host here, gosh, Rick had to put a lot of work into this to possibly, f- you know, it fix some some deficiencies on the part of Microsoft. Of these five executables, which of them are Rick being really focused, you know, you personally being really focused on, on, on attention to detail, quality, and agility versus a deficiency in Visual Studio? So I, I think if Mirror Shim's only job is to put up a banner, I, I, I'll say that that's not a deficiency in Visual Studio. But we've got the, the, the outer wrapper, the unzipper, the check for for uh, .NET, the check for the different runtimes it needs. With, you know, How many of these five executables are required because we didn't give you, we, Microsoft, didn't give you what you needed to make an awesome application? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, a lot of it just stems from the complexity of the Windows environment in general. Uh, mm-hmm. Just you know, setup shim has to, or setup shim, like I said, is the bootstrapper or the chainer, which has to then call setup front end, which is the actual UI that you get. Mm-hmm. But before it calls setup front end, it has to make sure that certain dependencies are there, like .NET and Windows mm-hmm. installer. Um, and so that's probably the one that I would focus on uh, in answering your question. That mm-hmm. Because Windows doesn't have a built-in way of me, or it doesn't have a built-in way for me to be able to tag something. Uh, using, like, say, some metadata to say, hey, this requires .NET. So before mm-hmm. you run this, make sure that the user has that package. Uh, so you don't. So you're saying that, that you don't myself. like the 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 standard stuff, like because the, the 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 setup program that pops out of Visual Studio will check for .NET and make sure it downloads it and stuff. It does check for .NET, but all you get is an error message. Oh, I see what you're saying. And it basically says. Um, Hey, you need .NET, and here's the URL for it. Uh, come back when you've got it installed. And the problem there is that most users will give up. Okay. Because it's too difficult to go get .NET. Although it has I improved see. recently because they put uh, they put those you know get it now download links on the front page instead of having you to you know do a search for it and then right. wade through the download page and try to find the download button. Well, and with yeah, well, actually, I, I was one of the I was one of the guys that worked on that to make that easier. Um, right. If so, if you but if you build a client profile uh, installer, you just hit setup and it'll automatically go and get the tiny setup and download it and, and keep going. Right. So a lot of that is improved with .NET 3.5 SP1 as well. Okay, cool. Because I want to... And, and, and then you just took a job at Microsoft, is that right? Right. I actually... Um, I was I worked there for about four years, and then I kind of took the summer off, and now I'm back. Okay. And what work group do you work in? I'm working in uh, Windows Fundamentals. Oh, cool. And are you, are you going to take all this feedback about making a really awesome setup program back to the team to make sure that it's awesome for the next version? Uh, back to which team? To the deployment folks, to like, to well, to everybody, to yeah, Visual I've Studio actually, I've actually uh, met with them a few times and uh, talked with some of those guys, and they're they're actually incorporating a lot of this feedback because there's sort of a long tail of freeware applications out there, which deployment of .NET, you know, they need .NET to run, but, you know, there's like a little 50 kilobyte shareware app cannot mm-hmm. include .NET because that would balloon it to 50 megabytes. Yeah, but it exactly. also is a lot difficult for that author to you know make sure that the user has done it installed. Yeah, well, like with my little application, Baby Smash, I'm using Click Once, and I'm starting mm-hmm. to think about things like, well, now I've got a couple of you know some some number of thousands of people using Baby Smash. How do I upgrade them effectively? What happens if my certs expire? I haven't gone and done any of the signing ahead of time. You know, I'm I'm starting to wonder then, if I'm going to paint if myself you want in to a localize corner. or if you want to translate your program into other languages, how do you make sure that your installer is localized? Yeah, exactly. And wouldn't wouldn't you like I would think if, if I if I had the pressure of having something as popular as paint.net um, you know, kind of hanging over me, I would think what's the nightmare scenario? I assume that your nightmare scenario would be a lousy upgrade that would cause every or some large number of paint.net users to have to reinstall. Right. I guess the nightmare scenario would be um, so right now the current version that's on the website only requires .NET 2.0, mm-hmm. and so we're kind of at a a known complexity in terms of installing that. Yeah. But now, if I want to upgrade everybody to .NET 3.5 SP1, you know, for example, if the next version of Paint.NET requires it, which it will, right. um, 
all of my users are going to have to install the new version of .NET. And so I have all of the installation. Um, so whenever you install something, there's a, a statistical failure rate. So mm-hmm. if 1% of my users can't install the new version of .NET for whatever reason, then right. that, you know, I ended up, I end up with a flooded email box or just a lot of people who are now no longer users of paint.net. Yeah. Now, are you going to use the client profile? Is that your goal? Yeah. So the paint.net version 3.5, uh, which um, I'm hoping to get out within maybe like, let's say two months, uh, mm-hmm. I've radically simplified the installation process so that it doesn't say, hey, you need to go get .NET. It actually just runs the bootstrapper for paint dot, or for .NET framework. Uh, the other thing I did was uh, there are some users who are on what, what I call a fresh XP box, and they uh-huh. need to install Windows Installer. And it's not so much that there's a lot of people in this situation, but f- when they are in that situation, it's just a dreadful experience because they go to download paint.net, and it says, hey, you need to go get .NET. So, okay, they go to the website, and they get .NET. Mm-hmm. But then they go to try to install .NET, and it says, hey, you need to go get Windows Installer. And so they go, um, okay, and then right, know, and people are dropping off all the way. Figure out how to go and get this. Windows installer installed, right. and then suddenly they go back and try to install Paint.net and says, "Hey, you need to go get .net." And they and they just kind of, it, it's a really frustrating experience. So now I have these installers built into the zip file, and it just runs them. Yeah, that is much cleaner. You know, I think that I don't see those issues for two reasons. Because one, I I, I have Windows Update update everything for me which I think mm-hmm. some people don't. I mean, I'm always going to my uncle's house or my cousin's house, and I just, I'll just i run Windows Update, and there's always some thing that they never clicked on, right? There's always that that check that says, you know, make sure you have Windows Genuine Advantage, or some thing that they haven't clicked on, and then I'll discover that they haven't had Windows Update running successfully since April. So they don't have the latest service pack of .NET, or they don't have the latest whatever. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, there's there are those people who keep their machines updated and then there are those that just get stuck somewhere along the line. And then the other issue is right. dial-up versus broadband, right? Having ubiquitous broadband, I don't think about a, you know, a 60 meg download. It doesn't mean anything to me. But if you go to New Zealand or somewhere with metered broadband or Africa, somewhere with just dial-up, then uh, installing something simple like a little 1 meg paint program becomes a, a day-long event to get your system up to date. Right. So a lot of people think, well, why do I need to download 50 megs for this, you know, one megabyte program that's just, you know, it's a paint program and then they give up and, you know, just use the built-in stuff like <clears throat> paint or, you know, they go, you know, for the larger programs, which they think have a better value proposition for the amount of time that they have to spend acquiring it. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be nice to get this stuff, to get 3.5 everywhere, you know, to... Right. Uh, so they do have that GDR release coming up, which should help a lot, actually. Right, I'm actually going to be doing a blog post about that, about um, when the uh, GDR general distribution release, is that what it's called, GD, general, what's GDR stand for? I think it's general distribution release. So we say general distribution release release, GDR yeah. release. That's going to be coming out uh, in a downloadable form by the end of the year, and then it'll be up on Windows Update sometime at the beginning of the year. So I'm going to do a whole blog post about that. So when when when, when that happens, we'll start seeing rolling updates, and then we'll be able to count on people uh, having, you know, who have Vista being updated to 3.5. So that should make life a little bit easier for, for you as, right. a, as an Although ISV. There is still the, uh, for programs which still have to run XP, which is quite a bit of them, you mm-hmm. still have to do the, you know, is Windows installer there, is .NET there, because right. the update isn't going for systems that don't have .NET anything installed. Cool. Are you going to continue to do blog posts on uh, on how to write software right and how to do how to get these installers correct? Um, I don't have any specific plans, but I mean these these things kind of come up whenever I you know get in the right mood for writing stuff. And, you know. <laughs> well, I really I really enjoy uh, Paint.net and I enjoy your blog. Your blog is at blog.getpaint.net. Uh, uh, you put a lot of really informa- cool information up there. It's all very transparent. You talk about what your plans are, and you know you put up your usage statistics. You know how many people are hitting the site per day, what uh, what operating systems they are. It's really cool to have such a uh, a transparent sharing of information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fun to write this stuff. It's just a matter of you know when do I have you know whenever I get the free time to do it, um, I have to choose between 
working on paint.net or say drinking beer or playing video games. And so (laughs) sometimes the latter stuff wins out. I'm glad that you have your priorities straight. Cool. Well, thanks, Rick Brewster, for talking to me about paint.net today. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week.